for me, what I'm most interested in is the fact that it is a, an explicitly feminist, egalitarian document. It seems to stand outside normal political culture in some ways in Ireland in this period. It's extremely advanced. I don't think there's anything quite like it anywhere. It is so advanced that Hannah Shee Skeffington, who's Ireland's probably best known suffragette at this point, says herself, there's nothing to match it apart from perhaps Russia. And we were first, she says proudly. Both Kathleen Clark and Hannah Shee Skeffington say at different times that one of the signatories of the proclamation was against the equalising tendencies in it, uh, but neither would say who it was, unfortunately, but it's quite fun to guess who it might have been. And that, when I read that, it got me thinking and I started then to look at the political, some of the political activism of these men, the signatories, outside nationalism in a way. And I was surprised to see just quite how um, actively some of them supported women's suffrage. A number of them were married to suffragists. A number of them spoke on platforms from the Irish Women's Franchise League. Uh, obviously, James Connolly is the one that people think about most because he was very explicitly pro-women suffrage. But I think the suffrage sentiments of some of the others have not really been explored as much as they could be. Because I think what, what, what always stands out to me is the fact that amongst everything else these men had to be thinking about, in the week before the Easter Rising, they stopped to write an explicitly egalitarian clause into the proclamation. Now, why they do that, I think, is a very interesting question and one that we should think about. And I suspect a lot of it is to do with the fact that they are, these men, probably more influenced by feminist thinking than we have, as historians, allowed. Um, they are influenced by suffrage arguments, I think. The other aspect of this that I find very interesting and I was very surprised about when I did my research was quite how quickly this meant something to women. Um, Margaret Skinner talks about using the proclamation two days after it was read out on that Monday to insist that she be allowed to go on a dangerous military mission during uh, on the Wednesday, Easter, uh, Easter week Wednesday. She said, she, her commandant says, no, you can't do that. And she says, well, actually I can because the proclamation says that we're equal, so I'm going to. And the man she says that to is very conventional in some ways, despite the fact that he is participating in a military revolt as part of the Irish Citizen Army. But he nonetheless acquiesces, which I think is interesting. So the power of the proclamation is there to see in that little episode. Thereafter, it appears very, very frequently. It starts appearing in Kumanaman literature quite often, talks about the proclamation having given women the right to be equal in Ireland. And this is a trope, it becomes like a mantra. Um, you know, you see it all over the place in Sinn Féin, with Sinn Féin women, with Kumanaman women. I think for Kumanaman immediately is very important because a lot of the movers and shakers behind Kumanaman have wanted to emphasise the, the feminism of their organisation and they have that they have that proclamation there. Now, if, as far as they're concerned, it's formalised and nobody can take it away from them. And a group of women who are very active in Sinn Féin do the same thing. When they, when they go to the Sinn Féin convention in 1917, they also talk about this and they have a motion moved which formally equalises men and women within Sinn Féin. So I think the impact of the proclamation there on paper in black and white is something that we can't underestimate.